Okay, let's start our lecture today. Last lecture, we finished chapter two, linear time invariance system by looking at uh, a set of conditions under which the memory list, uh, causal, stable, and the invertible properties of LTI system hold. In chapter one, we know that we can validate whether these properties hold or not uh, by looking at the input-output relationship. And uh, for LTI system, we have an alternative and uh, sometimes even simpler method to tell those properties by looking at the unit impulse response functions, H of T or H of N of the uh, LTI system. And this uh, function H is an inherent property of the LTI system, which is usually given to you when we, when we specify the system. And then we came to, then we came to uh, chapter three, Fourier series for periodic signals. So let me emphasize that uh, this technique for your series is only for periodic signal, both continuous time and discrete time. And to recap what we learned at the end of the last lecture, let's look at this, this diagram. Sorry. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, so we have an LTI system. Uh, what motivates our study of Fourier series is to obtain the response of LTI system, but it is for a particular kind of signals, the periodic signals. Say we have periodic continuous time signal X of T. Uh, as a matter of fact, in practice, most of those periodic signals can be written as a linear combination. This linear combination has an infinite number of terms. Each term is associated with exponential j omega t. It is a purely imaginary exponential signal. And by Euler's formula, we know that both its real, uh, both its uh, real and imaginary parts are uh, sinusoidal functions, so cosine sines. And if input signal has that structure due to the time invariance and the linearity of the system, the output signal has the same structure, which means it's the same coefficient linear combination. For each term, there is only an additional function h of this j omega k, which is explicitly defined using an integral that involves the unit impulse response function h. And to begin the process of obtaining the response of this LTI system, the first step is to express x of t as such a linear combination. In particular, we need to know the coefficient a k and the frequency omega k for each term. And that representation is called the Fourier series for x of t. So we have this definition or we have this format for Fourier series. And a, a, a focus of this chapter study is to determine omega k and a k for each term. And once we determine those two terms, the right-hand side only contains a single variable t. So it is consistent with the left-hand side because both sides become a function of the time variable t. Now let's look at an example of Fourier series. We have this signal x of t, which is cos sine 40 plus sine 70. And then how we write the Fourier series for this signal. Uh, let me give you a hint that we can use Euler's formula. And let's do it quickly in uh, two minutes. Ah, I got a question in the private mode. Are the signals we counter usually periodic? No, I'm not seeing that. Uh, I'm only seeing that if we are given a periodic signal and then practically 
these periodic signals can be expressed as Fourier series. There are very uh, rare special cases that even periodic signal cannot be written equivalent to that Fourier series, but they, these signals are out of the scope of this lecture, uh, of this class. Okay, let's look at this example together. So we want to convert X of T as a linear combination of complex exponentials. So applying Euler's formula, uh, the exponential J K T cosine K T plus J sine K T, the standard Euler's formula. And it is always helpful to write exponential minus J K T as well. So we replace kt with minus kt everywhere. The cosine function is a, the cosine signal is an even signal. So it doesn't matter if you add a, a negative sign, but the sine signal is a so-called odd signal. So the negative sign must be uh, put outside it. And if you look at the summation of those two equations above and below, you get that exponential jkt plus exponential minus jkt is two times cosine kt. Therefore, I mean, inversely, cosine 4t can be expressed as exponential j4t plus exponential minus j4t divided by two. If we make the difference of the equation above and the equation below, exponential jkt minus exponential minus jkt, we get 2j times sine kt. And inversely, sine 70 with k taking particular value 7 can be expressed as the difference between exponential j70 exponential minus j70 divided by 2j. So for sine signal, don't forget this j on the denominator. And we can simplify it a little bit. So we split it, this expression as four terms because j squared is minus one. So when we put j from the denominator to the numerator, don't forget that we need to flip the positive negative signs. Right? So the exponential minus j70, the second term has a positive sign. The first term has negative sign. This is the Fourier series for x of t. It looks a little bit different from the standard definition where I put in the blue box. Because the standard definition says Fourier series in principle should be an infinite sum. But the, each term of the infinite sum, so this AK can be non-zero, it can be zero. If you allow them to be zero, then Fourier series can be a finite sum as a special case, as in this example. And if you look at this result, say if we look at the first term, it is understood as a particular term in the Fourier series where AK, the coefficient equals one half, omega K, the frequency equals minus four. And the second term is a different four term. The coefficient for second term is still one over two, but the frequency omega K for the second term is four. 
So for omega k equals minus four and four, these are two different terms in the Fourier series representation. Right? So, but this is a very um, special signal. It has a simple form of cosine sine. Most periodic signals in practice might not be that simple. So for those general periodic signals, obtaining that Fourier series might not be that straightforward. So not simply by applying Euler's formula. The next we will learn a general uh, routine procedure to calculate Fourier series of continuous time periodic signals. So let's start with an example. Looks like this, we have a periodic signal X of T. And from the figure, we can tell that its fundamental period is uh, T, right? Because if you look at the center of this square, which is at zero, we remove this, we, we move this center from zero to capital T, then the signal coincides with itself. So by definition, it is the period of this signal, actually the fundamental period, because we cannot find a period that is even smaller than capital T. And for this kind of signal, when we express them, it is usually uh, sufficient for us to only write the expression within a particular period of X of T, because the mode of X of T will just repeat in the other periods. Say we express X of T in the period from minus T divided by two to positive T divided by two. And the expression of X of T in this period is the following. When the absolute value of T is less than capital T one, X of T equals one, which means the height of this rectangle is one. Otherwise, which means when T absolute value is larger than T1, smaller than one half T, then it is zero. So X of T takes zero value in this region and in this region. Uh, both negative region and the positive region is zero. And for this kind of signal, let's study a routine procedure to calculate its Fourier series. And to do that, let's first get prepared with some fundamentals associated with the signal. If we are given an arbitrary periodic signal X of T, the first thing is to find its fundamental period capital T. I believe this should not be a difficult task because we've been through some training in uh, starting from chapter one. And then after knowing capital T, the next thing we calculate is two pi divided by T. We denote this quantity by omega zero and we learned before that it is the fundamental frequency of this periodic signal X of T. Associated with this fundamental frequency omega zero, there is a set of imaginary exponential signals, e to the power jk omega zero T, where this k is an integer index that ranges from minus infinity to positive infinity, including zero, including plus minus one, plus minus two, and so on. And this set, this whole set of exponential signals, they have a name, they call it harmonically related complex exponentials. Well, this name is not that important, but next, this family of exponential signals have an important property that we need to understand. So this property says following. If we take one member from this family, exponential jk omega zero, we take another member, exponential jn omega zero. And the second member, we put additional minor sign in front of the exponent. We take the multiplication of these two signals, these two members of signals from this family and it is still a signal over time. We take the integral of this signal over time in an interval, in an arbitrary interval of length t. And then we divide this integral by capital T, the fundamental period. 
the result is the following. If exponential jk omega zero t and exponential jn omega zero t are actually the same member from this family, in other words, if k equals n, then the result of this integral is what? Otherwise, if we are taking this integral with respect to two different members from this family, then the result is always zero. So no matter what value of k and n we take, as long as they are different, then the integral is zero. So let me explain a little bit more about this integral with the subscript capital T. I said it's an integral over an arbitrary interval. It means we can take this integral from zero to capital T, or we can take it from minus T divided by two to T divided by two, or we have other options that is whatever we think it is convenient. But the result of this integral is always the same, no matter how we choose this start and end of this uh, period, this interval. Ah. So next I will explain why this property holds. But before that, let me add some remark. This is not on the slide and it's not a piece of required knowledge that you need to know for, the, for, this, uh, cl for this class but I think it is interesting for some of you to think. This behavior between this family of uh, harmonically related functions, exponentials, can remind us of something else that has a similar behavior. So if we consider the Cartesian coordinates, right, in particular, a three-dimensional space in the uh, Cartesian coordinates, we have three particular vectors. 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. From our linear algebra class, we know that this set of vectors is called a standard basis of the uh, Cartesian system, three-dimensional Cartesian system. And if we take the inner product of these vectors, so the inner product of the same vector, say 1, 0, 0, and 1, 0, 0, gives us the result 1. And similarly, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, if we take the inner product with C itself, the result is 1. But if we take the inner product of two different vectors, say 1, 0, 0 times 0, 1, 0, then the result is 0. So this, this behavior can be extended to the signals, to the exponential signals over time. If we understood this integral as the inner product between exponential jk omega zero t and exponential jn omega zero t. We can find that the inner product between two same two identical signals is one and the inner product between any pair of two different signals is zero. So in the Cartesian system we call a set of vectors with this behavior, an uh, orthogonal basis, an uh, orthonormal basis actually, or an orthonormal set of vectors. And in the signals, in continuous time signals, we call this family of harmonically related exponentials, we sometimes also call them the orthonormal basis of periodic signal with fundamental period T. Okay. This is just a remark that relates this with something we learned before. Now let's come to the property itself. So how we prove this property? Let's look at this integral. First, look at the simple case where k equals n. Right? I wrote it on the bottom of this slide. If k equals n, then the product of these two signals is just exponential zero, which is one. So I'm taking a constant signal with height one over an interval with length t, the result is t. And divided by t, the result is one. So the first case, k equals n, is easy to prove. Now the second case, k and n are two different integers. This is a little bit sophisticated. Let's look at this case. So we first combine these two uh, exponentials as one, so we have k minus n, 
And by Euler's formula, it is cosine k minus omega zero t plus j sine omega k minus omega zero t. And we can split the real and the imaginary parts as two integrals. Because the integral is always ha has the uh, linear property. And next, we will only show that the real part, in particular, this integral, sorry, this integral for cosine dt is zero. A similar approach can show the imaginary part integral for sine is zero because the sine cosine really have a very similar behavior, the same behavior in our context. So how we show that this integral cosine dt equals zero. So we are added by this figure. Let's plot this signal. Cosine k minus n omega zero t. Recall that we are looking at the case k and n are different. Therefore, k minus n cannot be zero. It can be one, it can be minus one, it can be two, it can be minus two. But here, let's look at a particular case where k minus n equals two. So in that case, when we plot this cosine signal, we need to pay attention to its relationship with the fundamental period of x of t. So recall that fundamental period capital T is two pi divided by omega zero. Here we are looking at the case where k minus n equals two, actually it's absolute value equals two. Then two pi divided by k minus n absolute value omega zero, denoted by t prime is only one half of the capital T. And why this T prime matters? Because it is the fundamental period of this cosine signal, cosine k minus n omega zero T. So intuitively, if k minus n equals plus two or negative uh, or minus two, then each period of this cosine signal is only one half of the original period of x of t. Now, if we look at this integral within the period capital T, because we are taking this integral within any interval, as long as its length is t, this interval does not need to start with a point where cosine takes value zero. It does not need to start with the highest or lowest point. It can start with an arbitrary point but we need to make sure that it spans an entire period capital T. Therefore, where it is started, it must end at the same point of the next period. So we start it at this very weird point. It ends at this weird point where it is in the middle of the ground and the, of the valley. But even in that case, if we take the integral within that period, look at the shaded area, the result is zero because the shaded area below the horizontal axis is considered negative value. If you count those area, they happen to cancel each other. And intuitively, we get the result that integral is zero. And this not only holds for the case where k equals n equals plus minus two as plot in this figure. If you consider other k minus n, for example, if it equals three or equals one, we have the similar structure which renders this integral to be zero. So this result always holds. Now we have proved that property, right? This important property, we will prove that. Let's put it aside for a little bit and come back to our uh, central task, which is to calculate the Fourier series. Okay. Now, if you look at this expression of Fourier series x of t, we notice a little difference. So originally, let's flip back a several slides. So we say that this is a Fourier series. For every term, it has exponential j omega kt. But now at this point, we can replace this omega k with a k omega zero. We already determined the omega zero, which is the fundamental frequency of this given signal x of t. Then for each term of the Fourier series, this omega k is in particular k omega zero, which means the multiples of omega zero. 
then our remaining task is to obtain a k, the coefficient for the term, for this term. So how to obtain a k, that's why we need this property that we will utilize here. So let's look at how to calculate a k. So we start with this integral. So this signal x of t is here. We multiply it with an exponential minus j n omega zero t. And x of t, since we want to express it as the Fourier series, so we replace it with its Fourier series form. Uh, because of this equality, we can replace x of t with this. And under practical conditions, we can flip the infinite sum and the integral. So there is some mathematical condition for this swap of the, of the integral infinite sum. But in our class, let's, uh, let's assume that those mathematical conditions always hold. So we can put the infinite sum at the beginning. We can put the linear coefficient ak first, and then all the rest is just an integral. So now this coefficient one over t is moved afterwards ak. And this integral was only remain, remaining in the integral ex, exponential jk omega zero t, which copied down this term, and exponential minus jn omega zero t, which copied down this term. If you look at this integral, it is associated with the property that we proved above. But in particular, the property tells us, so, so the, we are looking at this integral for every term indexed by k. But among all these terms, there is a particular term where k equals n. For that term, applying this property, it equals one. So we replace k with n, replace a k with a n. That particular term is a n times one, which is a n. For all the other terms, as long as k is not n, then this integral is zero. Zero times a k is zero. So the result is zero. But this property helps us to convert this infinite sum as a finite sum, in particular a finite sum with only a single term which is a k, uh, which is a n, sorry. Now let's summarize this result by only retaining the, the, the beginning and the end of this equation. It tells us that a n, a n equals this integral, one over t over integral over any interval of length t x of t exponential minus j n omega zero t dt. You can check that this is exactly the term where we began with in the last slide. And it does not matter if we change n to k on both sides. So we change this a n to a k, we change this exponential minus j n to exponential minus j k. This actually tells us the formula to calculate a k. I get this question, what is n? Well, the n is just a particular integer that we select for the purpose of looking at a n. Because we already used the k for the index of this infinite sum. So when we want another integer, we need to use a different symbol. Just remember that if you, when you, when you do the C programming, right, you do the, uh, the, the loop, we have i from one, i plus plus, and then if you need another integer, you need to define it with a different symbol, j. So that's the same philosophy in our case. Whenever we need a different integer, we, we use a different symbol. But within the same equation, say within this equation, we can always freely change one symbol to another. We change this n to k, then we must change the n on the right-hand side to k as well. When it's an equal substitute. But anyway, let's look at what is in the, in the uh, blue box. So calculate a k, we need to take the integral. x t is given. Omega zero, we already determined. So k 
exponential minus jk omega zero t is a uh, family is a member of the family of harmonically uh, related uh, exponential signals, and this integral can be calculated in an explicit way to obtain a k that holds for every integer k. So that this relationship holds for every integer k. So now let's summarize the entire procedure to calculate Fourier series. So we are given an arbitrary signal x of t. The first step is to identify its fundamental period t and the fundamental frequency omega zero. The second step is to calculate Fourier series coefficients. Right. So there are infinite number of terms in the Fourier series. For every term, there is a k. For every term indexed by k, there is a k. And for every a k, we have the same way to calculate this, this coefficient by using this integral. And then, after knowing all the a k, we can represent x k as Fourier series in steps three. So infinite sum, every term has a k exponential minus, uh, exponential j k omega t. So let me emphasize the difference between these blue bo boxes of step three, two and step three. In step two, when we calculate a k, what's in the integral is exponential minus j k omega zero t. But after we know a k, when we write the Fourier series, for every term, ak is followed by exponential plus jk omega zero t. So please notice this difference when you do your exercise or homework. Again, let me put a note here. This k omega zero replaces the omega k. So where we started the definition of a Fourier series in the previous page. Now, since we've learned the procedure, let's come back to this example. So how to calculate the Fourier series for this periodic signal. Since this is the first example, we will go through it together. Okay. For this signal, we've already determined its fundamental period is capital T. So for this example, capital T is given as a constant. Then fundamental frequency omega zero, two pi divided by t is also constant. A step three, oh, well, the, for this example, I split this, the step one and two, so the, the, the index of the steps does not matter. So calculate ak, right? So the ak, we copy it from this blue box, one over t integral over interval length t, x of t, exponential minus jk omega zero t. Again, don't forget this minus sign. And here t is constant, just a copy down. And for this integral of over interval of length t, we can select this interval out of our convenience. And for this example, let's select this interval to be minus t divided by two to t divided by two. As long as its length is capital T, the result is the same. So we select this interval. X of t, exponential minus j omega zero t, so what? Everything is copied down. But we can shrink the region of integral by changing from t divided by two to t one. Notice that t one is where this height one starts because outside of this minus t1 to t1 region, x of t is zero. So the integral in that region can be discarded. We only return this region where we can replace x t with its value one, value one in this region. Exponential minus jk omega zero t is copied down from the last step. At this point, we need a discussion. So whether k equals zero or not. When k is zero, 
this exponential signal becomes exponential to the power zero, which is one. So I'm taking integral of constant one. The result is the length of this interval, which is t1 minus, minus t1, 2t1. Don't forget we have divided by capital T. So the result for k equals zero is relatively simple. But when k is not zero, we are looking at a non-trivial exponential, complex exponential signal. And when we move this signal outside of the integral, don't forget that we need to have additional coefficient minus jk omega zero on the numerator, right? That's the rule of integral. Actually, that's why we need this discussion because if k is zero, we cannot put a zero on the numer on the denominator. This only holds for the case k is non-zero. And we take the difference of this term between its upper lower bound, t1 minus t1. Okay. So we replace the first term t with t1, second term t with minus t1, and it cancels the minus sign, so it becomes exponential plus jk omega t1. Now here, we've already finished the calculating AK because everything in this expression is known. T and omega zero are known in step one, step two. K is just the particular integer index for AK. We eliminate all the unknowns, but we can further simplify this expression by applying the Euler's formula. Right. So remember, if we have exponential j alpha minus exponential minus j alpha, the result is 2j sine alpha. Apply it to this term, we have minus 2j sine k omega zero t1, because the term with the minus sign comes first. But this minus sign is cancelled with the minus sign on the denominator. That's why there's no minus sign at all and we eliminate the common factors in the numerator denominator a little bit. And then we notice the fact that omega zero is two pi divided by t, which is in the red box in step two. Then we can get a simpler expression, a compact expression, which is in terms of only the constant pi, the constant t and t1, which are already given in the original figure and the integer index k. So every term a k is a function of k only. It only depends on a k. And to summarize the two cases, a k, when k equals zero, it is two t1 divided by t, so this case. When k is not zero, it is this case. This sine function divided by k pi. Okay. Now we can write the Fourier series of x of t. So it is from our standard definition, infinite sum, ak exponential plus jk omega zero t. So this, there's no negative sign in the final step of express, expressing Fourier series. And omega zero, this should be omega zero, but we know that omega zero is two pi divided by t. So why not we change it? by two, 2 pi divided by t because t is what is given in the figure as a constant. AK, we already cal calculated AK above. So this is the full expression of X of t. That finishes this example. Okay. So uh, we have five minutes left for this lecture. I don't think we have enough time to finish the Next example. Uh, I'll stop here. Let's have an early release. And uh, uh, don't forget there is a tutorial starting from 10.30. Okay, uh, next week we will continue the study of Fourier series for continuous time signal by looking at more examples. And then we will look at some useful properties of Fourier series. See you next Wednesday. Thank you.